Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1060, Trigonometry for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Chapter 8, uh, which we begin here in Lecture 24, is going to be about the topic of oblique triangles. What do we mean by that? Well, in this, in this trigonometry course, uh, very early on, we studied triangles. Specifically in, in our lecture series, chapter two was focused on solving right triangles. In chapter eight, we're gonna return to the study of triangles. Uh, but up to this point, we've essentially only studied right triangles. There was an occasional rare, I should say, equilateral or isosceles triangle that'd pop up here or there. Uh, but for the most part, almost exclusively, we've been studying right triangles. In this chapter, we're going to study non-right triangles, which are called these oblique triangles. So we don't have a right angle uh, in the triangle anymore, but we want to solve it. And remember, what we mean by solving here, like we did back in chapter two, is we're going to have some combination of angles that are known. So like maybe we know angles A and B, and we know some combination of sides. We're always going to have three of these. Uh, three angles, three sides, or a combination of three. And then we want to determine the missing pieces that are still left to be determined, right? So if we know angles B and uh, A and B, can we find out angle C? Can we find the side lengths B and C? And so it turns out the techniques we, we've learned when it came to right triangles do have some application to those oblique triangles as well. When it came to right triangles, we did things like so Katoa, sine, cosine, tangent, to help us determine uh, this missing information. Uh, for oblique triangles, we have to be a little bit more careful because the trig functions like sine, cosine, tangent don't apply directly to oblique triangles, but using things like the law of sines, the law of cosines, which we'll develop in the in these in these lectures right now in this chapter, we'll be able to do that very, very quickly. Um, now you'll see these diagrams a lot, the, the one like this. So a few things I want to caution you about is one, never assume that the diagrams I draw are drawn to scale, because uh, honestly, I make no effort to draw these to scale. You'll see this exact same picture over and over and over again, because it's just copy and pasted on these slides there. So don't assume things are drawn to scale. So don't panic about things like that. Um, also, just remember it's convention when we draw triangles here. Um, it's quite typical when referring to the vertices of a triangle, we use a capital Roman letter like ABC. Um, when it comes to a triangle, referring to the vertex, these corners here also indicates an angle. And so we we'll commonly use the exact same capital Roman letter to refer to the measure of the angle as well. So you have angle A, angle B, angle C, etc. All right. Um, opposite any angle will be a side of the triangle. So this would be the, the side which is opposite of angle A. It's common convention to use the same Roman letter but lowercase to also indicate the opposite side of the angle there. So capital A and lowercase a are an angle and its opposite side. Likewise, you have angle B with side B and this represents another angle opposite side. We say this a lot, so we often use abbreviations, acronyms to refer to this. This is an AOS, an angle opposite side. Whenever you have an angle opposite side pair, uh, that's actually really good when it comes to solving for these oblique triangles. Whenever you have an AOS, that's when the law of sines comes into play, but we'll talk more about that in the upcoming video, okay? So like I said, when it comes to solving oblique triangles, you're always going to have some information about the triangle, uh, and then we have to solve for the remaining information in the triangle. So you need at least three bits of information in order to solve a triangle. If you have less than three, like if you only know two, um, two of the bits of information, so this is two of the angles or sides or some combination, an angle and a side, that's not enough to solve the triangle uniquely. So you need at least three. If you have, a th if you have three, in most cases, you can then solve the remaining information in the triangle. Uh, and so you're going to see these acronyms here. So AAA, AAS, ASA. What these are, there's just abbreviations here. In which case, every time you see an angle, excuse me, every time you see an A, that'll refer to the symbol angle. Whenever you see an S, that'll refer to side. And so what you want to, what, what this means for us is that if you see something like AAS, you should interpret it as you know one angle, Oh, you know, a second angle and, you know, a side of the triangle. And the, the order of these things does matter. You have an AAS versus an ASA. The difference here is that with ASA, the side, you know, is between the two angles, you know. On the other hand, if you know AAS, this means the side, you know, is not between the two angles. In fact, 
the side would be opposite this angle right here. And so you have an AOS as opposed to ASA, which you don't have an AOS. You actually have the interior side uh, that's between the two angles. And so the order of these symbols, it tells you, the, this is just a code to help us know what initial information do we know about the triangle? How can we solve it like so? Okay, so the first one, which we've actually studied this one before, we're not gonna see much more of AAA in this chapter for the following reason. AAA means you know the three angles of the triangle, and it turns out there is no method to solve a triangle if you know the three angles of the triangle. And it turns out that this AAA case cannot be solved because there's not unique triangles. Uh, AAA actually describes similar triangles that we've talked about before similar triangles. Uh, similar triangles occur exactly when two triangles have the th same three exact angles. And in fact, given any three angles, AAA, there's an infinite number of single, similar triangles that'll share those same angles. And so the best we can say about AAA, the best we can say about similar triangles is that this, the three unknown sides will be proportional to each other but they're not necessarily unique to each other. So AAA is not a congruence condition for triangles. You only get similar triangles. And so what I mean by congruence conditions is recall that two triangles are congruent to each other if there's some correspondence between angles and sides so that the three angles are congruent and the three sides are congruent to each other. Um, if you know that two triangles have the same three angles, that shows they're similar triangles, doesn't give you congruence. We don't know the triangles are congruent to each other. But these other conditions can actually guarantee congruence of triangles. So there's the AAS condition, angle, angle, side. It turns out if you know two of the angles of a triangle and you know a side that's not interior to those two angles, then you can solve for the entire triangle using the law of sines. We'll see how to do that later on in this lecture. And this actually shows us then that if two triangles have the same two angles and exterior side, then those two triangles have to be congruent to each other because we can find the missing pieces and they have to be the same. Similar to the, a the AAS condition is the ASA condition, angle side angle. So the side is now interior to the two angles. It turns out that using the law of sines, you can show that if you know two angles and the interior side, then you can solve for the triangle. So whether, whether the side is exterior or interior, you can solve for the, the, the missing information using the law of sines, although the approach is a little bit different, which is why we still need to separate these cases. So if two triangles, satisfy the same ASA condition, they're actually congruent to each other. We're going to see that in this lecture here. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to pursue two more cases, A or excuse me, SAS and SSS, that is the side angle side condition and the side 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 condition. Side 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 means we, we know all three sides of the triangle. Um, and then using the law of cosines, which we'll introduce in the next lecture, we can show that we can actually determine what the three angles have to be. And so if two triangles have the same three side, side, sides, then actually the two triangles have to be congruent to each other. Similar to the side, side, side condition is the side angle side condition for which what we mean here is that we have two sides and the angle is interior. The angle is between the two sides. If we have side angle side, then the law of cosines will apply and then we can find the missing sides of the triangle. So if two triangles satisfy the same side angle side condition, they have to be congruent to each other. Uh, the last, the last uh, possibility on this list is the side side angle condition, uh, which means, uh, so SSA. So in SSA, what we have here is we know two sides of the triangle and we know an angle, but the angle is exterior to the two. Um, we're going to refer to this as the ambiguous case. This case is a little bit more complicated and will have to be treated in its own right, which we will do that in its own lecture following the lectures about law of sines and law of cosines. So in this lecture, 24, and the subsequent videos, we'll learn about the law of sines and how we can use it to solve the AAS and the ASA condition using angle opposite sides, AOS. In lecture 25, we'll talk about the law of cosines and show us how to solve the SAS and the SSS condition. And then in lecture 26, we'll consider the ambiguous case, SSA, all by itself.